Uh, today we have a very interesting topic uh, for today's session, uh, which will be covered by Dr. Tim from Lincoln University, New Zealand. Today's topic is new pathways to the seller door, the importance of user generated content and virtual wine tourism for future New Zealand wine branding. Dr. Tim, who is with us today, is a lecturer of marketing at Lincoln University, and he's also the program coordinator for the Bachelors of Commerce marketing program. His research areas lie in international marketing, sustainability, and global venue checks. He has done a lot of research on the virtual wine tourism marketing with the global wine industry as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic and issues related to treatment of migrant workers within the wine industry. We welcome you to this session, Dr. Tim. Thank you. We also have Ms. Eni, who is the International Manager for Lincoln University. We welcome you also, Ms. Eni. I will Namaste. now- Namaste, thank you. Thank you, thank you, namaste. I will now hand over the proceedings of the session to Dr. Tim and Ms. Eni, and I'll request all the participants to please post their questions towards the end of the session. Over to you. Cool, thank you very much for that great introduction there. And um, just like to welcome everyone who is um, Zooming in to the session. So let's get into it. I know your time is limited. You guys are all very busy. So we're just gonna get straight on into looking at um, the importance of salad door sales uh, for New Zealand wineries, and also look at this whole idea of how New Zealand wineries have actually um, had to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic using user-generated content or what we call UGC. Um, so this has become very important for New Zealand winery branding. I've got heaps of examples for you guys. I know it's the, the morning for a lot of um, you people who might be watching this. So uh, I've kept it kind of quite bright and engaging just so um, you don't fall asleep, which is very important at this uh, time of the day. Right, here's the structure, here's what to expect. This is what you're going to get. Um, today, a brief def definition of uh, wine tourism will be coming your way. We will also be making sure that you guys understand what uh, user generated content UGC is. And as you can see from the picture there, that, that could be you, right? With a VR goggle set on walking through a winery, but not quite being there. We will look at a definition of uh, brand architecture. Then we also get into looking at branding in the New Zealand wine industry, which is an area where a lot of my research um, has been engaged in. Um, if you want to look into more of this in particular, there is um, online, if you, if you have a look at it, if you go to Google Scholar and um, Google my surname and um, looking at branding in New Zealand wine, there's a couple of book chapters that I've written there. My doctoral thesis is up on there. In fact, if you're having problems sleeping, I always say to people that um, four pages into my doctoral thesis, I guarantee you'll be asleep or your money back. So that's just one thing that I always, always mention to people. But however, this presentation is not going to be like that because we've got this added element now of a pandemic. And this, when I was back doing my doctoral research, the pandemic hadn't happened yet, right? And looking at wine tourism, which is an area which I've researched for over the last decade, wine tourism not seeing anything like COVID-19 in terms of cutting down international travel. Now, New Zealand's an island nation. And as an island nation, we are very, very dependent, not only on agricultural uh, exports to other countries to bring money into the country, but also heavily dependent on tourism. Tourism is huge for New Zealand. So if we don't have international tourists coming in, we are actually in some serious economic trouble. So with COVID-19, obviously we've had to shut uh, international borders. We only in the last couple of weeks have a um, bubble that has reopened with Australia. However, parts of that bubble have had to be paused occasionally. There was a recent outbreak in Victoria and Melbourne that you guys may have heard about last week. So I've actually got friends of mine who are over here from Melbourne at the moment who are stuck here and can't actually get back home because um, of the lockdown over there. 
So it is a fast changing, very fluid situation that we're dealing with. We also look today at how we coordinate our brand elements and stakeholders. Now, the, one of the diagrams that I'm going to show you is before COVID came into effect. And what's happened with COVID is it's really made the wine industry in New Zealand have to think differently about how it promotes itself. I have some fresh research from, um, for you guys as well, um, some overseas studies based on what is happening currently in um, the United States, in Europe, Greece, and Germany and um, places like that, essentially looking at overseas trends and how virtual wine tourism is going as an actual concept and also as a way to bring in revenue to wineries that are struggling due to COVID. So let's get into it and um, have a look into what's going on. Let's kick off with some definitional aspects. So we always set the scene by defining what it is that we're talking about. So I borrow here from Professor Michael Hall's definition of wine tourism from 1996. And Hall states that it is the visitation to vineyards, wine wreaths, wine festivals and wine shows for which grape tasting and or experiencing the attributes of a grape wine region are prime motivating factors for visitors. So we can see there a bit of user generated content actually happening down the bottom of the screen. We can see that um, Alpine Wine Tours, now they're based out of Queenstown here in New Zealand, and Queenstown is an area which relies a lot on uh, international tourists and has been hit hard by COVID. So what they're trying to do now is really engage with the domestic wine tourism market here in New Zealand. And here we have them sharing the Instagram of Kimberly there in the picture, who's gone to visit the Gibson Valley Wine in, uh, Winery in Queenstown. We also have the fact that we see that in the background, cellar door tasting experience, so wine tasting, ex the ex experiential aspects of the wine tasting there, right in that picture. So that's a bit of user generated content right there, courtesy of Kimberly, which has been shared by Alpine Wine Tours. So this is like organic street team marketing, if you will, taking it right back to the core and getting your end consumers to literally do the marketing for you. If we look at our definition of user-generated content, we borrow from Newbury in 2019, has the definition here. So it's created by you, the people, rather than brands themselves. However, brands do come in and moderate the user-generated content that they use, so it's not a free-for-all, an unmoderated free-for-all. Uh, they will make sure that the user generation content is on brand. Uh, so on their social media accounts, website, any other channels that they might have going. So for example, you'll see a lot of New Zealand wineries use YouTube quite effectively as well. So if this presentation gives you a bit of a hankering to check out New Zealand wineries, then just run a YouTube search on some of them and you'll be able to see exactly what's going on in terms of how they are navigating the pandemic. The definition here from Newbury talks about the content side of it, text, videos, images, reviews, and so on. And what's interesting now is the reviews um, for virtual wine tasting are actually starting to occur on places like TripAdvisor. So it's like you can't go there to the actual winery because of international border closures. However, people who are experiencing a virtual wine tasting, which we'll see some examples of coming up, are actually able to still post reviews of their experience just like they were there. So it's, it's quite interesting. I was looking at some of these today and thought, wow, that's really next level. That's kind of crazy. Not actually going to the place, but experiencing it through taste and also through the visuals um, of a virtual wine tour is next level. It's something that is starting to really take off in the wine industry. So it's a whole new perspective as we see here in um, sort of Lonke's uh, way of looking at user-generated content underneath that definition there, and um, marketing their product to wine tourists, offering this new perspective, is also engaging people and keeping them engaged with the brand as the pandemic goes on and continues. So it's not like the brands disappear, they just find new ways of re-engaging wine tourists. If we uh, continue on to um, have a look at this um, 
side of things, here we have the concept of brand architecture. Now, here's some examples here of New Zealand wines on the screen. So brand architecture, you're looking at your markets, how you manage things and brands, but in New Zealand, we are known also for our scenery, right? So the scenery is very important in terms of how the, it's displayed on the bottle. So it's not only a sense of where the wine is made. So we can see here, we have Clifford Bay in Marlborough uh, as part of the brand architecture of that bottle. We have also the fact that we have the logo at the top um, and it says where it's, where it's actually made. Um, also this aspect of the purity of some of the resources. You can see in the second um, diagram here, where we have made with real New Zealand here, referring to the natural resources. Also, we have the percentage of um, the wine that is produced there um, in Marlborough, in case you're wondering, it's around roughly around about 70% of New Zealand's wine actually comes from this region. So this uh, is it's really big, getting the brand architecture right. And you'll see down the bottom there, the colors used also in the bottling, pure, very um, coming in that watery sort of blue, very important for the brand architecture as well. Other examples of New Zealand wines, if you um, have a look at uh, New Zealand wine labeling, you'll see heavy use of the scenery in terms of the brand architecture, also brand stories. So usually these brand stories are articulated using uh, what we call a hero figure who might be the uh, founder of the winery or someone who's been involved in winemaking for many years. How about the New Zealand wine industry as a whole? Let's have a look at this. And you'll see that the wine industry's international competitiveness is huge, but it's been dented by COVID. Now, how wineries and uh, nations handle this can actually be the making of the, or the breaking of their industry. So New Zealand Wine back in 2012, pre-COVID, looked at their promotion in this way. Said, generic promotional activity focused on building the New Zealand Wine brand awareness and understanding. And then second, we're gonna have user pays events targeted at individual wine brands. So it's still very much back in that whole idea of getting wines shown at trade shows, um, wines in terms of uh, wine and food festivals. That was one of the main places that you'd find them. Um, the idea of virtual wine tasting was something of science fiction. Even though the basic technology was there in 2012, it wasn't as refined as it is now in 2021, but um, the idea back in 2012 of what we're talking about today was literally something of science fiction. Now, if we're looking at brand elements and stakeholders, now in New Zealand, we have a lot of stakeholders in terms of our wineries. We not only have the local community, we also have our relationship with the Māori economy and local iwi. We also have uh, government, um, community groups, uh, non-government organisations. The list goes on and on, right? So the New Zealand wine industry needs to also have a coordinated approach with not only wineries, but also those who are responsible for tourism branding for each region within New Zealand. Now, this prior to COVID has been something that has actually been criticised by a number of wineries. Um, and the idea here of uh, making sure that wine regions were widely promoted and promoted in a standardised way, so the branding was on point and people who lived and worked in those regions, knew what the taglines were, knew what they would uh, use if they were uh, looking for hashtags on uh, social media, what do they do with their posts and things like that. There was a need for a refined strategy back uh, in the early part of 2014 that we noticed at. So in our research uh, within the branding of the New Zealand wine industry, needs to have coordination, right? So we have in the diagram here, we have the, the winery itself, so we have the estate or the vineyard. Then we have the, uh, could be a sub-region that it is, is in. Uh, we have a sub-region here in Canterbury, which is where um, Lincoln University is based. Uh, there is a sub-region called Wipera Wine, which is quite famous uh, internationally, produced some beautiful wines. 
Uh, we also then have the wider region, i.e. the Canterbury region, the country of origin, New Zealand, um, and then we might have wines from a particular part of the world. And these are known as supranational in terms of how they are branded. So European wines or wines of the EU is a good example of this. So you have some very, very, very formal rigid ways in which branding is used. So we're looking at the government level. Um, but if we're looking at uh, social media and virtual wine tastings and branding, this tends to take place at a very informal level. So there is a number of strategies at play. So if we're looking at this, we have an integration strategy, which which is all about formal alignment, uh, making sure the corporate brands and national brands are all aligned and also products know what they're supposed to do in terms of imagery or what's known as a separation strategy. So this is where you've got different images from different stakeholders coming in from left, right and centre. Um, can be quite hard to organise into a unified, standardised brand, as you can imagine if you've got a lot of wineries in a region all also competing to get noticed online and also to attract as we as we now mainly only have domestic wine tourists other than visitors from Australia here in New Zealand the competition is tough and it is ruthless so having a good brand strategy is one way to get really noticed so there also is the need for support from regions so we have regional themes in terms of um, the websites that are online and you can see a number of these if you go through and just do a search on um, Waipara Wine New Zealand um, and um, have a look there. There's some great wineries there that you'll be able to see uh, naming um, a couple of them, just a few of them. Um, the Bone Line is a great winery up that way. There's another one called Terrace Edge. All playing their part in the greater regional development of the Waipara region. So regional based themes are very important. One of the regional based themes you'll see to attract tourists is wine and food pairings, which is important. Um, so it's a total package because the reason why um, wine tourism needs to be a total package for um, any visitors, including those who um, uh, just sort of dipping their toes into the wine tourism experience is it's been shown in the past that uh, uh, in wine regions people people go to a winery sure for a wine tasting but they also pick regions based on other cultural events that occur in that region as well so it's not just wine tourism that is the sole thing that brings them in so um, wine tourism doesn't need to be promoted in isolation it actually needs to be promoted as some sort of a uh, like a, a package bundle to bring people in and to really ignite their imagination let's have a look at um, some other things that are important for New Zealand wineries here's where we have the wine experience or the experiential elements now back at the start of the presentation where we saw Kimberly standing at the cellar door uh, in her Instagram photo um, she was showing the experience of the cellar door as it was occurring for her. <clears throat> now, the other thing uh, to note is location. We can see the scenery in the uh, image down the bottom there, uh, the number of wine regions also here in New Zealand. Um, and in the South Island there, um, you will see Waipara, which is very um, much a big part of the Canterbury region in terms of um, us being internationally recognised for wine. Roughly about an hour and a quarter away from Lincoln University where all the um, top uh, wine people reside um, in New Zealand. So um, you will find that also not only that beautiful scenery and location, but climate is very important as well. So New Zealand's not uh, a country that has escaped the effects of climate change. So um, wineries themselves are very mindful of the fact that even the slight change in temperature can actually alter the, uh, the uh, quality of the grapes that they produce. So climate is very important as well. Also, let's face it, when you go to a winery and you want to um, have a look around the scenery and, and um, spend time in a particular location, you'd like to be able to wander around, wander amongst the vines. You want a beautiful, fine day happening. 
when that happens. So the climate is incredibly important in a positive wine tourism experience. However, here's a couple of things to think about, just some food for thought. And this is from um, the doctoral study that we did um, back in 2015 and 2016. And this is uh, some figures from the New Zealand wineries. Uh, let's see, 538 New Zealand wineries surveyed. Uh, and this is asking them their attitudes towards tourism. Now, if we look at the 2015 figures, we can see here uh, some of the uh, higher figures there, uh, almost uh, just 69.2% tourists are valuable. Tourism attracts a wide range of customers to my winery, 67.7%. Um, and also very important, the one down the bottom, second to bottom there, tourism increases awareness of my winery through word of mouth, 66.2%. So we have that word of mouth, right? However, let's think of word of mouth and put the E in front of it for electronic. So we have e or electronic word of mouth. So given if we don't have tourists coming through to New Zealand, it makes sense that wineries decide to explore this e element of their branding in order to keep their brands alive and to keep that relationship going with the potential virtual wine tourist. So here's um, a couple of images there from what happened last year when we had our first lockdown. Here's Wiper Hills Winery, uh, just um, outside of Christchurch there. And the um, image that you see, the important announcement one, so this was directly after the uh, first lockdown that we had. Um, this lockdown went into effect in March the, uh, March the 26th, 2020, was the day that basically we went into a level four lockdown, borders closed, um, no one could go anywhere. However, we moved through the alert levels and then eventually we got to level two. So you see the first one is, right, that's it, we're shut till further notice. Second one, level two update, says cellar door remains closed until further notice. Um, we're dedicated to the safety and well-being of our clients and our, our team, and we'll keep you updated through our social channels. So there you go, there's a clue. We'll keep you updated through our social channels. You can already see where these wineries are wanting to uh, reinvigorate their brands in very tough times. It's all through those social channels, providing that linkage from the brand to the end consumer. So moving on with what happened after this was some articles started emerging, right? Um, this article from 1st of September 2020, and um, what happened here, this was after the first lockdown, and New Zealand had actually gone into uh, a, a second uh, lockdown in August and September last year, and this was making people quite nervous. And the lockdown that occurred then was shorter and sharper, but still for wineries and businesses around New Zealand who were trying to financially claw their way back from the first lockdown, um, they were starting to sing out and cry out for help. So there was a lot of challenges in the industry. As you see here from Beverage Daily, they said uh, in an article from that was published there, that uh, wine growers were going to be forced to rethink part of their workforce, and here's, here's another clue, reimagine our tourism activities, and the outlook is going to be challenging. However, what they thought was going to really save New Zealand wines was reputation-based aspects. Sustainability, diversity, good leadership, keeping an eye on what's worked in the past, and also building for the future in terms of current successes. And this is where innovation in the wine industry creeps in. Because what we've got is the sixth largest export good, right, for New Zealand, which is New Zealand wine. So it's not something that we can uh, just shrug off lightly, okay? It's very important as an industry, it employs a lot of people. Um, and also the other thing for New Zealand is a large part of the workforce at the wineries um, were migrant workers. So with migrant workers no longer able to come into the country due to the border closures, we were in really dire straits here. So essentially what needed to happen was looking at uh, what was going to happen in terms of domestic tourism. Were um, domestic tourists actually going to be interested in being wine tourists in New Zealand. 
However, there was some sort of, there was a lot of nervousness as, as well with the opening up of wineries and even accepting domestic wine tourists uh, because people were thinking, okay, well, what happens if community transmission happens again? Um, can I actually make a booking to have a function at a winery or is that going to be cancelled? So there's a reticence that people had for wanting to actually do um, social events. Also, the wineries are really crying out for government support as well. And the government have come through and offered financial packages here in New Zealand for a lot of businesses. So we've been uh, very lucky in that regard compared to um, a number of other countries. Here's just a couple of figures for you guys. This is from New Zealand Wine, um, the annual report from 2020. Just a couple of uh, figures. You can access this infographic in the annual report if you want to dive in and have a deeper look at it at some point. But um, Essentially, this is all talking about what happened after COVID. What did they do? Okay, get some hashtags happening. We have hashtag love New Zealand peanut. And um, this was one that was pre-COVID, but they amplified it um, and really pushed it um, during the lockdown. We also see that um, they had a campaign that was um, started in at the end of 2019, but this was amplified last year as well, the hashtag New Zealand Wine 200 campaign. So it's 200 years since the first vineyards uh, were created in New Zealand. Um, now, the goals are really important of these campaigns as well. Getting a digital presence, but for different varieties of wine is really important. But also, as you see with the 200 years, sharing interesting stories. So getting a brand story, developing that brand story online around New Zealand wine. Uh, this one down the bottom here, Goal, direct consumers to their closest cellar door on NewZealandWine.com. So here we have them thinking, okay, so what region would you like to drink the wines of? Uh, order some wines, get them sent to your house, click in the code that's in the box and join in in that virtual wine tasting. So very important in terms of branding is the social media aspect. So here we have virtual wine tastings coming to the fore. And... There's also flat rate delivery fees for products, uh, e-commerce becoming hugely important around the world for the sales of wine. And also, if you're talking about virtual wine tasting, we also call it OWT. You might see it referred to in some of the literature as online wine tasting. So this has really grown over the coronavirus pandemic. It's really taken off. The technology was all, the technology was there, good to go, but um, not many people were really taking the risk and in innovating in this area. Now, everyone seems to want a piece of this area. If you look at a lot of the wineries around New Zealand, got a few examples coming up, uh, but it was pretty exhaustive looking at what was actually happening um, around the country here. So you can experience this from the comfort and safety of your own home. You don't even need to step outside your bubble. So this is really important as well. Here's what's happening in the United States. Let's look at a global context uh, from Bloomberg. Winemakers turning to Zoom tastings to survive lockdown strife. So here we see a winemaker in the Napa Valley and a number of people who have um, signed up to essentially get uh, bottles of wine sent to them from the vineyard and the winemaker is talking about the production process and people are sitting there at the other end with the actual wine in their hand able to do a tasting as the wine producer talks them through what they are doing. Of course you do need to um, buy the wine direct from the winery first okay get it sent out to you um, but this is a new way for wineries to stay on board and get their brands, still keep their brands alive and out there um, as the pandemic rolls on. If we're looking at brand elements and stakeholders, now there's a number of things to think about when you're thinking about regional and place branding. The three things um, that are really important here is, okay, so you've got to have good place association and branding in terms of a synchronization happening between both of them. The other two things, as we see here, a really solid value proposition. Why would wine tourists want to engage in wines from your region? What's the quality of those wines like? So we have a quality perception as well. 
And this is nothing new. As you can see here, Atkinson was talking about this 20 years ago um, in the uh, late 90s when they looked at the fact that consumer demand was really important, but also globalization in the wine industry was something that was really driving change as well. And you had multinational ownership of wineries occurring too. So if you're looking at national place attributes and regional place attributes, and you're thinking about this, you think, well, how does this even fit in if we have national branding, but we also have a national brand where people are a little bit cynical of. So here in New Zealand, this has occurred with the 100% um, uh, pure New Zealand tagline. Some people are on board with it in terms of the wineries, other people aren't. Sustainable Wineries New Zealand has um, had problems within their campaign here in New Zealand, where some wineries are happy to pay the fee to be a member of this um, government endorsed program, there are other wineries who don't believe in paying the fee to join it because they believe that they, they are practicing sustainable practices but don't actually need to um, pay to be a member of a group that advocates for it. So it's very interesting. It's almost like a little bit of a rebel alliance happening uh, within a New Zealand winery. If we look at brand imagery and um, such like as well, if we look at wine branding online, then how do we even moderate what it is that is coming through in terms of user-generated content? Because user-generated content also can mean that you can have a lot of different images to choose from, but who is gonna spend time sifting through all of that? So it's up to regions to come up with a really clear, concise brand that they want. Um, so from a national level, if we look at uh, New Zealand wine, here's the image from New Zealand Wine Week. Um, so this is Wednesday, 10th of February earlier this year, uh, looking at um, what was going on within New Zealand wineries. And this was directing people uh, through the New Zealand wine website and also the hashtag made with care from New Zealand. Um, and this is a very important hashtag that's been uh, really used a lot through the COVID-19 campaign to keep the New Zealand brand alive in terms of exports. We also see on the winery level, let's have a look at what Glengarry wineries have got going on on their Instagram. So we can see here that they've got a um, virtual wine tasting and Wednesday, 2nd of June, Oh, that's coming up pretty soon. I might be off to book into that. You think, well, hey, you can, but hang on, how's that wine going to actually get to you? So what you it takes a bit of organization, right? So this is a, a, a tasting that's held live uh, on Instagram. So that you just uh, jump in there on IGTV and um, essentially get there at six o'clock and you can go through and have a tasting of the Grant Burge Inc. range. So that's a form of virtual wine tourism right there on Instagram. Here's another one from uh, Hop and Grape. This is a recent example as well from here in New Zealand. Um, and so note the tagline there, Around the World Adventures from Home. Um, now, this um, is a New Zealand wine from Marlborough, making it all the way to the United States. As we can see here, this article made it onto NBC News. And um, people were actually able to do a tasting of a wine from Marlborough here in New Zealand in the United States uh, via Zoom. And it made it onto NBC News as a form of wine tourism. Down the side there, you can see uh, how they run these events. Uh, you can book them for a private tasting. Uh, up to 10 guests, so uh, participating in a Zoom session. Uh, the only thing is, you, it is in New Zealand time, so depending on your time zone, might not be the greatest time to sit down and have a drink. Um, and um, there is various different time zones down the bottom there, and um, that's how people engage with that. You can also ask questions um, during the tastings as well. Here's Cloudy Bay, their virtual wine tasting. Um, Note the tagline here, create a cloudy bay moment in your own home. So you don't even need to leave your bubble. This is an insurance policy in the COVID era. So bringing the stories of Cloudy Bay, New Zealand wine, and the Cloudy Bay experience ambassadors guiding you through a wine tasting. 90 minutes, one to 10 people, 
And it's also got a map of the location there that you can hit on, bring it up on Google Maps. Uh, you can see a pricing here of $350 New Zealand to uh, book that. Um, so um, that's what Cloudy Bay are currently doing with their virtual wine tastings. Now, does it work is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Is it, is it, has it been successful? So what we have here is a Sroski um, 2021 actually had a survey that was sent out in uh, the later part of 2020. And the survey was sent around um, global wineries and um, they managed to get 1,423 wineries from 42 countries to respond. Um, however, 87% um, 80, came from old world wine countries. So we're looking at France and Italy and things like that here. Would have been nicer to have uh, more of a response from new world wine countries like New Zealand and Australia. However, that is a direction for future research right there. However, if we look at what's going on here um, in terms of the success, so it's an interesting side of things here. We're 61% saying it's partly successful. So they're dipping their toes in, trying. 8% saying no. 31% saying that they are successful online wine tastings. Let's have a look at some other figures from the same study. Wineries and online tastings. Um, share of wineries conducting online wine tasting. 61% saying um, that they didn't. 36% saying uh, it was because of COVID. 3% uh, saying that they were doing it pre-COVID. If we look at the willingness to continue from the survey participants with online wine tastings, um, should we, fingers crossed, be in a position where the pandemic actually calms down, then 64% saying yes. So obviously that points towards that's been a good little revenue stream there for a lot of wineries. 34% saying maybe and only 3% saying no. So there is, seems to be a reasonable future in um, online wine tasting. Here's some more findings there from the same study. Um, so this type of wine tasting really hadn't taken off prior to the pandemic. It was being done, but not on the level that we're seeing it now. However, if you had resources to do Virtual wine tasting size was very important. Size and resources that the winery had available to them. So this really affected the um, offerings that wineries were able to put across online. Um, and if you're looking at platforms, uh, we did look at Instagram as well in terms of IG uh, Live and uh, IG TV. Uh, however, Zoom was the main platform that wineries were using. Um, mainly also because of the functions where people could um, share their screens if they needed to, um, and also the lack of registration or download necessary. Um, and also, if we're looking at things like the age of people who might be participating in some online wine tastings, and if they're um, of a um, more senior age group, they might not have an Instagram account. So we need to also consider aspects such as that. Just before we wrap up, um, other findings. It's a good revenue stream, got decreasing sales happening here. And one of the wineries that I know has been hit um, in the region of Queenstown here in New Zealand is the uh, Gibson Valley Wines. It's an amazing um, maker of wines. And um, so what they've done is every second Saturday, they've got these online wine tastings happening. And it's been a great money spinner for them. Um, essentially, it's a new revenue stream coming into the business that even as tourists gradually come back into New Zealand, they are not going to let go of this as a revenue stream. This is becoming an important part of their business. So hopefully, in tandem with tourists coming in, we have raised profitability. Um, people can also... Uh, conduct tastings based around a certain amount of time as we saw before 90 minutes seem to be roughly around about the maximum that uh, companies in our examples were offering. So leveraging sales, going across more marketing channels, strengthening your brand um, and also focusing on business to consumer sales and um, it'd be interesting to see if people actually demand longer tastings in the future. This is something that's still relatively unknown. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of us um, having a look at user-generated content and how it can help us strengthen the New Zealand wine brand and possibly provide new pathways to revenue.